next guest spent his entire 20-year career with the Lakers, five titles, two finals MVPs, and was named to 18 All-Stars. We welcome Kobe Bryant to the desk. Thank All you right. so much for being here. Debut in Canvas City Muse Cage. Yeah. We are very uh, much looking forward looking to it. Looking smooth, bro. Looking smooth. I got to say, I'm very, very impressed. Sharp. I'm very impressed. Whatever extra time you took back there, it paid off. Look at this. You finally said when you admit that dress is better than you? Yeah, I'll give it to him. Today. Okay. <laughs> I value your opinion. <laughs> yeah. mm. As you know. So for yeah, those go. that aren't familiar with your project, we want to share a clip and then get into it, okay? Okay. Check it out. Every muse cage is powered by two forces. Light musing. You're nice. Oh, thank you. You're great. Oh, so nice of you. <laughs> and dark musings. You're worthless. <laughs> You're a <laughs> Stop. Yeah, light musings make you feel good and happy. Yeah. Dark musings make you feel bad and angry. Uh, I don't like dark musings. Most people don't, but what they don't understand is that dark musings just may be our greatest source of energy and power. Whoa. If you're looking for your inner beast, it's most likely living inside of a dark muse. Really? Uh, I don't know. So, Kobe, I saw you yesterday on NBA Countdown and saw a larger clip of this. Now, obviously, as someone that's not a world-class athlete, I love this because as a life school, life skill, I feel like it applies to anybody that's trying to hone a skill and trying to reach success. But tell us more about this project. Well, I wanted to create something that the whole family can enjoy. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted something where the, the mother, father, children could all sit together on the couch and watch a program where they're digesting basketball content that enables them to be better, but it's content that the kids can enjoy as well. Mm -hmm. And then when it gets to the basketball breakdown portion, how can I break down the game in a way that's entertaining and easily digestible? And uh, that's what we try to create. We try to create sports content for the entire family to enjoy. Why, con why content product? Like, you know, when Magic retired, he went into business. And it was like a variety of businesses. Sure. And you, right away, we heard he basically wants to be Steven Spielberg. Like, you know, he wants to make things. W why content creation for you? You know, I, I fell into writing at a very early age. I had a great uh, uh, teacher in high school, Lou Marion, Jane Mastriano, who taught speaking arts and uh, how to write structure and all these other things. And I just fell in love with it. And so when I first came into the league, I started writing my own commercials and started working. Uh, on storytelling and so then when I retired I knew exactly what my passion was going to be and so I fell right into that and I think as athletes and as people all we can do is just follow what our what we enjoy doing the most and uh, see where that leads. How long uh, uh, before you retired uh, how soon was it that you knew that this was something that you wanted to do I imagine it did just take place once you retired because you are a planner. Well uh, I, I kind of enjoyed the process of storytelling but then when it came to uh, doing the the Muse film uh, the documentary film, that's when I really fell in love with it. Because then I started falling in love with the process of actually writing out the chapters and then, you know, kind of structuring things visually and so forth. And, uh, and then to see the reaction that I, that, you know, we received from people from the film of saying how much it impacted them, uh, and that just really centered my focus. I'm thinking about today's game. And I want to know how watching today's game, even though you were a participant, you're also an observer to some degree. You kind of know what's going on. You always have. And now that you stepped away from the game because you're retired, you're watching from afar. Clearly, you're trying to impact a future generation mm -hmm. on the come up. But how much does watching today's game and how it has evolved, how much did that influence the work that you're doing now? Um, some. But, you know, what we try to do, what I try to do, is write content that a, a child can understand and digest, but also have the messaging be at such a level that professional athletes can understand and learn something from. Because these are experiences and things that I've gone through and learned from. So, you know, at the end of, end of the basketball breakdown, when I say, you know, reading the game will make you a good player, understanding what you're reading will make you a great player. But, but if you can write the game that others read, you become a champion. Right, and that's a, that's a different level of understanding where you're not reacting to situations, but you're the one creating the situations that others react to, right? That is the whole key. Kobe, you're not, you're not a normal competitor, even by the insane competitive levels of the NBA. 
you were an abnormal competitor. So I, if it's not a championship, it's a wasted season, right? And that's why you won five championships, one of the reasons. He was in his muse case. What is the right. championship for you now? Because now you're in a, a subjective, right? You're trying to create content and things that's more artistic and creative and not, they're, they're on the same kind of objective measurement of how you're doing. So what's your championship now? Well, it's, it's the reactions um, from families. I see families say, finally, I can sit down with my son and messages that I've been teaching him this whole time, he's finally understanding and digesting through this content. That's a championship to me. I wonder when you're doing this kind of work, I mean, this is, this is clearly a beginning stage for you. Is there an ultimate goal in line here? And if so, what is it? Yeah, to keep getting better, to keep getting better. You know, from project to project, you know, we have a very close-knit family of, uh, of uh, producers that we work with to try to bring the content to life. And we just want to get better from project to project, that's all. What other stories are you really looking forward to telling? Well, things that continue to center around sport mm -hmm. and you know the emotional connection that lies within sport. Mm -hmm. And then how do you then communicate that in a very focused way, but in a way that touches the masses? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you take a basketball situation and relate that to human nature. And if we can do that and continue to do that, hopefully we'll inspire future generations as well as this Ready generation. for a bad Sports segue? Ready for a bad life. segue, everybody? Yeah. Well, how do you take a bad situation with the Lakers, Kobe? I mean, Magic was on our, was on our show uh, about a week before he got the job and says, the first call I'm going to make is to Kobe Bryant, which I hear as meaning I've already called Kobe Bryant. <laughs> what, are the, what do you do about the Lakers right now? Who's a keeper on the team? How do you change the culture? What do you do? What are you asking me for? I'm not, I don't work there. Right, but, but Magic said <laughs> you're the first phone call, which means you two have been talking about this situation. No, Magic, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to take this it's out. It's okay. Take it out, it's um, fine. We'll, we'll, let you, we'll keep Magic, you on track. Magic um, reached out to me and let me know that he was hiring Rob. He's hiring RP. And uh, he and I talked about how great it was um, and what they want to do going forward. And I just told him how excited I was for Rob. I mean, this job is tailor-made for Rob. I mean, this is what he does. And uh, so I've just been excited for both of them. But in terms of an actual... How'd they lose their way? You were on the team as the team lost its way. And how do you get it yeah, back? Well, things happen. Yeah, as you know, I mean, uh, um, things come and they go, right? It's a cyclical um, game. And you have your ups and you have your downs, and now it's time for them to start rebuilding and start putting pieces of the puzzle there that can win championships again. It's just part of the beast. Storytelling is one thing, and obviously you'll always be in a position to, to do that. A league MVP, a five-time champion, a surefire future first ballot Hall of Famer. Your credentials are impeccable. They are not to be questioned. So in that regard, you'll always be able to storytell, and that will never go anywhere. What I want to know is, when you have former players, whether it's aspiring to be a coach, which ain't you, an executive, or an owner, at least on an ownership level, does that intrigue you? Does that interest you? Is depends. that some, It depends on what? Depends. You know, my, uh, my passion is storytelling. I can't go away from that. This is what I love to do. I mean, this is what I get excited about waking up every single morning to do. Um, so are there ways that I can help the Lakers from that perspective? Yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, ownership perspective, maybe, but you know I me, mean, I like being behind the scenes and being passive and things of that nature. You know? uh, if the phone call came, I would certainly listen, but in terms of being there every day and doing that, well, not, not uh, necessarily for me. Not necessarily, I, I, I hear you there, not necessarily being there every day, but I'm just talking about from afar, but having a profound impact whenever you so choose. If you think about Magic, Magic's president of the basketball operations, he's a day-to-day -day guy, mm -hmm. but he talks about leaning on somebody like you because of what you mean Well, I'm to there me. now. I mean, they can call me now and ask for advice or you know, what I think about this thing about that. I mean, I'm always around, so. Kobe, Shaq got a statue. And I imagine- Pretty cool looking and, statue, too. And, and also talking to you and talking to him, you know, through the last several years, it, it seems to me that that was a situation where, boy, we didn't know what we had until it was gone. Like, I'm never going to, like, that guy was, how do you feel about Shaq sitting here today, him getting the statue the other day? What are your thoughts about Shaq? I'm really happy for him. I mean, he, you know, guy won three championships here, mm -hmm. right? And so. In a row. Uh, in a row. So it was, I was happy to see him and uh, uh, got a chance to catch up with him a little bit out back. And not only him, but all the guys, right? all the guys that we played with and kind of revisit some old stories. It's amazing how fast time flies. I mean, it's uh it's pretty, pretty cool. When was, last, when was the last time you hooped? 
Uh, since I scored uh, 60. Hmm. Yeah, like I'll shoot with my kids every right. now and then, but in terms of playing. Yeah, you know, th th that's, you know, you know, whenever we speak, it's amazing to me how you make no apologies for the fact that you really don't miss it anymore. You put in yeah. your time, it's enough, enough. You don't miss it. It's rare that you hear that from somebody. I know, it's strange. Yeah, it is strange. Leave it your own. But, it's strange, but, but it's, a, it's a blessing, right? I mean, the, the, the thing, you know, when you grow up playing a game your whole life, and this is what you identify yourself with the whole time, mm -hmm. it's very hard to find something else, you know? And I've been very fortunate and very blessed to have a passion that I love every bit as much as playing basketball. Mm. And so when that happens, I'm extremely fortunate. But for the young guys coming up, as you're going through your career, it's important that you start looking for things that you are equally as passionate about. Because when that music stops and the game is over and you're just trying to figure it out after, you're already too late. It's interesting that you bring up the word passion. Because when I look at today's NBA game, I see guys with great talent. Mm -hmm. I see guys, some guys with great passion. But it's a lot of money in the game compared to what, you know, I mean, it's a lot of money in the game. Let's just leave it at that. When you do what you're doing now with your storytelling, and I asked a question about monitoring today's game and how that, how that affects what you want to do. What are you seeing when you watch today's game? We got issues where we're questioning guys getting rest, taking rest, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, what do you see Super when you watch changing. today's game? Well, I mean, listen, the, the, the game has grown substantially. The age of social media has really altered uh, or grown the amount of opinions that we have available to the game. So as a, as a result, you have a wide-ranging opinion on one issue, uh, which is fine. But I think at the core of it all is the game itself. So if players are continuing to get better, that's what's most important. Now, in terms of uh, uh, the development of players, I feel like that has completely gone backwards. And it starts at a very, very, uh, at the youth level, and growing up through AAU and so forth and so on, we're not teaching our kids the fundamentals of the game. We're not teaching them how to think the game. And uh, that's a bigger issue. All the other things that surround the game will come and go. Uh, but the game itself is the most Kobe, important. is that really a bigger issue, or, or are you as an outlier? Like, you had a very well-rounded game, but yeah. not everyone did. There were a lot of bums compared to you then, just as there are now compared to the best players. Are you the old-timer now looking back and going, in my day, everyone knew the game. That was just you, or do you really think it's gone backwards in that way? No, it has. I mean, it, you know, our development in USA basketball, you can, you can just look at that on the surface and the difficulty and the challenges that we face in playing international competitions. So when when I grew up and growing up overseas in Italy, I was very fortunate because I caught the teaching time in Europe. So, you know, the Red Holtzmans, the Tex Winners, and all these great coaches at the time went over to Europe to teach coaches, have coaching, coaching clinics of how to train players. So when I was growing up, I caught the fundamentals of that game, right? Pau Gasol, Manu Ginobili, you know, same thing. And so you look at our, the difficulty that we have had in international competition is because these players learn how to play the game and think the game at all levels. Pau Gasol, just as comfortable handling the ball as he is in the post. Marc Gasol, right? You look at San Antonio Spurs and the way that they move the ball. Um, and so we have to do a better job you, developing you, our players. You, like we, we hear Jordan talk about LeBron, or there was that article where Jordan's talking about how he's watching LeBron, thinking how he'd defend him. Are you at the point yet where you look at the game now, and because the transition happened during this latter part of your career, the yeah. way that, you know, five out and all this stuff, and think if I was around today, coming up today, I would shoot more threes, I would do, I would, would your game translate to today or do you think it would be adapted? I don't know, I don't even think about it. You don't think about it? No, I don't. I mean, that's what, you know, Michael and I are really different in that, in that aspect. Um, I look at the game now and I try to find moments um, of, okay, that actually may make a good story that I can put out there for kids to kind of understand or other athletes to understand and watch. So it's a little different the, for me. The only, the only issue that I have with anything that you're saying is that you're dissecting it and you're being incredibly cerebral with it and I respect that. My thing about it, however, is that when I look at a lot of today's players and I look at today's game, that passion that we talk about mm. matters. And to me, your greatest gift to me was your determination. It was yeah. your will to be you. It was clear you put everyone unnoticed that you were striving to be the greatest ever and you did not apologize for it. Right. Do you see that in today's game? Because I don't. Well, Russell and James certainly aren't mm -hmm. apologetic about it. Yeah, that's true. 
right? So yeah. there are players out there like that. Kyrie Irving isn't either, yeah. right? So there are certain players out there that do that, um, and um, that's per perfectly fine. Kobe, what's your take on players, though, resting when healthy? Because I think you could do a nice story on that and, te and teach some lessons to the uh, younger generation. I kind of put people it in there in the, the, in the, the, the Kansas City mentality. opening jingle. I kind of put it in there a little bit about um, you know, no days off, no time to rest. But in terms of the integrity of the game or the competitiveness of the game? Well, here, here's the problem. The, 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 the problem is, you know, for uh, a family who spends their hard-earned earn money to come and watch their favorite players play and... You know, they show up and the player's not playing. Um, that's the tough part. Um, you know, I felt like if you could play, if you can play, you should go out there and play. If a coach said to you, you're not playing, would you have had an issue with it? Well, I, I, they're, they're I honestly, I've never... the coach's decision. Yeah, I've never been approached yeah. by a coach and asked me to rest. Um, I think they knew better than well, that. Well, to, <laughs> to me, what resonates, what resonates, and I'm not going to belabor this subject, but what resonates to me about players sitting down, it's one thing if you're not playing. It's another thing when you announce to the world it's because of rest. While you're dressed in street clothes, mm. chilling on the bench, smiling and laughing with your teammates when the fans came to see you play and you're a marquee well, and you're I mean, not there. They're, they're, listen, you, you can build your game differently, right? And I think... You know, one of the things I learned from MJ is on second nights of back-to-backs, uh, when it's fourth game, five nights, whatever the case may be, the game would alter. You might change his game a little bit. I might be on the perimeter the first two games. Now I'm going to slide down to the post. I'm going to play a little closer to the basket. I'll play off the ball a little bit more. All right, so there are ways where you can kind of alter your game where you can get rest within the game, mm. but still be efficient. We, 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 I mean, sell sports media through narrative, through telling stories. That's how people understand the world. How would you tell the story in that case, speaking of rest, of when Dwight was traded to the Lakers and you had Steve Nash and Powell and you guys were supposed to challenge for a title, D'Antoni's system wasn't working for the personnel, you kind of took over the situation, played 45 minutes a game or whatever it was, willed the team into the playoffs in the second half, but, <laughs> but the Achilles went. And it reminded me of John Henry, right? He, he, he had to beat the steam drill, but his body fell apart. Right, right. So what's the story there? Did I tell that story right, or do you have a different story to tell? <sighs> Let's see. I probably, uh, Icarus comes to mind, I think. Too close to the sun on too borrowed wings? I mean, you're trying, you're going, you're going, you're going, you're going. I'm on borrowed time. Got too close to the sun and my Achilles popped. Mm -hmm. mm. How about that? Kobe. And, if, oh. and if your Achilles hadn't popped, what do you imagine your career would have ended like? Nah, heck if I know. I don't know. Mm. I'm just asking for an imagination. I, I was just wondering. I, I think um, it wound up being a blessing in disguise for me because when the Achilles tear happened, it really woke me up into saying, okay, your career could come to an end now. Mm -hmm. Then what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. I've been thinking and planning and planning and planning. I say, okay, no, now I need to start putting things into action. Mm -hmm. I can't sit back passively because this can be over now. And then what are you going to do? Your Achilles popped when you were playing for Mike D'Antoni, who was the coach of the Los Angeles Lakers at that time. I wasn't too satisfied with the job he did in Los Angeles, but I will tell you, he's my coach of the year now in Houston. Yeah. He has been absolutely sensational. Can you talk about what you've been seeing whenever you've had an opportunity to see the, this team play? Because I'm looking at the Houston Rockets as a potentially huge, huge threat in the Western yeah. Conference. Well, you know, Mike's kind of dealt the raw hand here with all the injuries that we've had. We never had a chance to really get all the guys on the floor that he can coach and put them in positions to be successful. So this is a tough situation for him. Um, in Houston, with the personnel that he has, it fits magically. I think, uh, you know, what he's found in Harden is a player that's Steve Nash-esque, but bigger. And so now you can get into the paint, get into the teeth of the defense. You know, what we always try to do with Steve is put a bigger player on him. And when he gets into the paint, just try to blanket him with the bigger player and stay home on shooters. James can't do that because he has size, mm. right? So now once he gets into the teeth of the defense, you have to go get him, which then opens up the others, so... I look at him as the heir apparent to you, but I think about somebody like AI, who I obviously talk to, and his favorite player in the world is Russell Westbrook. He yeah. thinks Russell Westbrook reminds him of himself. Right. Well, we all should be fortunate that AI was in 6'5", actually. That's yeah, right. That's right. Then, then it's over. <laughs> That's yeah. right. It's over. So I'm just, so. I'm just asking you, who's that guy that reminds you of you, or who's your favorite player right now? 
Uh, I mean, there, there's there's three that I really enjoy watching. Um, you know, Russell, James, Kawhi Leonard. I love watching that generation. Kyrie. Um, I love watching them play. I just love watching them play. And, and Kawhi has been able to do, and you know, with the spots that he operates from, uh, are the exact, exact same spots where I like to operate from. Yeah. You know, the elbow, the mid post. You know, the one-two bump, turn left shoulder, fade, turn right shoulder, fade. I mean, I, I love watching those guys play. Kobe, right now, what's going on with LeBron? Um, I'm sure that you pay attention to him because that's really the guy who you passed the torch to. Unfortunately, you guys never met up in the finals. But all this resting and everything, we're really, oftentimes, we're talking about LeBron. Mm. He's in the finals every year. What is your feeling about where he is in his career right now and, and, and all of that? You know, that's the tough part is that when you miss a game, there's that one kid out there that's um, not going to see his favorite player play. Okay? Now, that being said, LeBron has done so much for the game, mm -hmm. right? So we need to give him, <laughs> he, he, he's earned the opportunity to be able to take a rest. He's earned that. Uh, we can disagree with it. Um, we feel absolutely terrible for the kids that come and watch him perform. But at the same time, this man has been to a finals pretty much every year for as long as I can remember. He's done so much to elevate the game. So he's earned the right uh, for us to give him the benefit of the doubt. Is that, is that something that ever crosses your mind or that you think about the fact that he wasn't on a good enough team to make the finals when you guys were dominant and then vice versa, that you never got to link up in a finals? Yeah, I thought in 2009 was a great opportunity for that to happen. Uh, I was hoping that was going to happen. It's great for the game. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen. You've earned the right to be considered one of the greatest ever. There were times in your career where obviously people drew comparisons to Michael Jordan and we all thought Michael Jordan was the GOAT. Then you were like, I'm Kobe. This is the way that it is and that's the way it's going to stay. But you don't hesitate to remind folks, look, this is what I did when I played. When This is even before you retired. Mm -hmm. Numerous coaches, how you had to play point guard, shooting yeah. guard, et cetera, et cetera. When you reflect on your career, what's your standing in your mind? What's the story that you tell you to yourself about yourself? Well, um, did I give everything I absolutely had to this game? Yes, I did. Right? And so that is the most important thing. The rankings, all of that stuff is inconsequential. You know, rankings come and go, opinions change, it doesn't matter. Right? When you can look yourself in the mirror and say, did I give everything I could? Did I do everything possible to try to get better? If the answer is yes, but don't you have an aspiration for people to see what you saw, whatever that is? Like, I remember one time you reminded me, excuse me, do you realize what I had to do this year when yeah. I didn't have X, Y, and Z? You did pay attention to those kind of things. Well, man, at the time, yes. Yeah. You know, as you mature and you get older, you understand, listen, it's not about that. It's, it really isn't. Mm -hmm. right? What you do is you do what you can with what you have. You know, everybody's path has a different narrative. Right, you try to walk yours to the best of your ability and let the let the dust settle where, where it may. Have you decided who's winning the title this year? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I haven't. I haven't. Now, to be completely honest with you, I haven't been watching right. the league like that. I mean, I, I have, so uh, it's tough for me to say. I mean, I, I see highlights here and there, but I haven't really been following that closely to be able to give an, an kind of an educated response. In. in case you missed it, Devin Booker, inspired by your path, dropping 70, and he said he was, it was, Oof. he saw an interview on you and felt like he could do that and go out there, so clearly. I but they back. lost. Yes. He still put When Kobe 70. dropped 81, he it won. was in a win, and they were losing at the they half. They were all on they the needed those page. Points. See how it all comes full circle, folks? Kobe, thank you so much for being here with us. We appreciate it. It was fun. Looking forward to uh, more content. We can check that out on ESPN.com, all of your work. We have to leave L.A., I'm, you listen, guys. I'm very proud Going of him. Back. I'm very, proud of, him. I'm very proud of the work. I'm proud of how he looks in the suit. I like the new beard look. Very like, sharp. Quite dapper. I must confess. Oh, I must Max, confess. you approve, too? Dude, very sharp. I don't listen, think I've listen, ever had a unanimous listen, decision. Like, like I said, I value your opinion <laughs> tremendously. Oh, please. That's sarcasm, folks, in case you didn't catch on. Kobe, appreciate well, you. See you guys tomorrow. You got me, bro. Have a great day. <laughs> Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.